So here I am in my car. Uh, I am in Denver, Colorado with Kathy and with Liam and with his senior class. We are here on their senior trip and that was why I can't be there with you this evening. Um, but I actually started out, we're staying uh, with an aunt of one of our students and I started out in her backyard sitting in front of a nice tree and it was going to be an idyllic setting and I, I took my phone and I perched it right on the, the lawn furniture and it just precariously and I reached out and I was just about to push play and the guy in the back started cutting his grass. Oh no. <laughs> So I thought, well, maybe I'll go around to the front yard. So I went around to the front yard, and by that time, the owner of the house had awakened, and she let me borrow a tripod, and I, I rubber band my phone to the tripod and set it up on the front porch, and I was out there on the front porch and just about to hit play, and a neighbor across the street in the front yard started weed-eating his grass. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do now? So here I am. I'm sitting in my car. I have my phone rubber band to the rearview mirror, and I get to be with you. Um, and I am with you. I'm with you in spirit. I want to celebrate Pat. Pat was my friend, my very good friend, and a brother that I... Um, have loved deeply and has really left a deep mark on my life because he and I we didn't uh, we didn't just hang out we didn't just have lunch we didn't just um, you know make things in his shop we didn't just sit in the living room and just chat about nothing although we did do all of those things we didn't just do those things um, Pat and I traveled on a spiritual journey that um, will forever have changed my life and has helped me to understand more about God, helped me to understand more about kingdom, and um, has been a tremendous blessing in my life. And I want to share some of those things with you um, just briefly this evening. You know, I met Pat uh, and Sandy when we were down on Main Street and Open Doors first getting started. I hadn't known Pat before then, at least not to my knowledge. And, um, you know, we hit it off pretty quickly we went we went out and had we probably had lunch I don't even remember all the details but um, we probably had lunch together first and then I know I started visiting him at his house pretty frequently and um, for a while there for about three months we saw each other every single day uh, because we had we committed to gather to try to know God a little bit and through that our relationship just just blossomed um, Pat, to me, was a very strong person. He was a strong man. When I first met him, um, I remember thinking how strong his grip was. For a guy that was, you know, kind of a small, petite, on more of a petite side, uh, he had a tremendous strength. And even, you know, having gone through all the things that he's gone through um, physically at that time, he was strong. I mean, we're, we're talking almost 10 years ago, I suppose, or seven or eight years ago at least, but um, I just remember thinking how strong his grip was, surprisingly strong, but the more I got to know Pat, the more I saw that strength in every area of his life, and that's not to say that he didn't have moments of weakness, because he did, uh, and part of his strength was not just physical, but he had a deep strength a deep strength within him that you know manifested as um, being a perfectionist you know Pat was a master carpenter he could he would laminate anything <laughs> and he would do it well he taught me a lot about using tools and and about I mean I knew how to use tools but he he taught me about, you know, never trust the fence on a table saw. Always measure from the fence to the blade. He talked, you know, he taught me about about working towards perfection and, and being patient enough and stubborn enough that it would be just right. Because for Pat, if it was going to have his name on it and he made it, it needed to be perfect. And that was part of his strength. And it was also part of his not, not necessarily his weakness, but part of his frustration for sure because as he went through these things physically and he started to lose the kind of control that he wanted to have in order to make things just right, um, you know, the, the pain was more than just physical. It was emotional as well. Pat and I got, a lot, got to do a lot of fun things together. We would eat at El Tequila's or we would eat at Uncle Benny's and um, 
I enjoyed introducing him to strangers and people as my grandfather. He and I, for a time there, we both had beards, and of course mine's more gray now, but his was more gray than mine, and I would introduce him as my grandfather. Of course, he was old enough to be my father, not my grandfather, but I liked to tease Pat. One of my goals, every time I saw him, I wanted to see him smile. I wanted to see, I wanted him to have fun, but usually that was me making fun of him or him making fun of me, and, and, um, but Pat knew I loved him. We, uh, I wrote down a few things here. You know, he would, he would, we would just go for rides. He'd say, what are you doing today? And I'd say, well, I got to do these things. You want to come? And he would just go with me. And a couple of times he even went to visit the hospital with me and visit people in the hospital. But he would, you know, if I had something to do for the church or something to make for camp or VBS, um, he would help me as much as he could. And he would loan his tools. Um, or he would loan his shop and I would come there and we would work together. And sometimes, you know, that would make the process a little slower, but um, it was doing it together that mattered. And um, we would, I remember that uh, one on one of our drives together, it was during the time when Kathy and I were trying to decide whether or not we were gonna homeschool and move out into the country and, and uh, I went by this house and showed him a couple of houses that we were thinking about buying. And he actually helped us make the decision on the house where we live right now. Um, I really valued his input. And I really valued the time that we got to spend together. We, um, he helped me uh, repair my house whenever uh, we had a flood in our house, in our Broken Arrow house, he helped me put down the flooring. When I say help, uh, he kind of pointed and and told me if I was doing it right or doing it wrong, and he would hand me wood. He'd sit in a chair while I was kneeling on the floor and putting pieces in place, and uh, even that would wear him out, but uh, it was time well spent. You know, in John 9, Jesus says, well, he's walking down the road, and he sees this blind man, and his disciples ask him, they say, teacher who sinned was it this guy that sinned or was it his parents that sinned that he was born like this that he was born blind and Jesus says neither this man nor his parents sinned but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him you know this was really what formed the spiritual battle for for Pat and for me because Pat had a lot of questions. Why is my life the way that it is? You know, when Pat was, I think he was four years old, and he has to have eight surgeries, seven or eight surgeries, fighting against brain cancer, the kind of brain cancer that nobody survives from. In fact, up until the very last, his very last days, I'm sure, the, the, the last few times I was in the hospital and they would see that he had this particular kind of brain cancer. People from all over the hospital, they would come into the room just to see him, just to ask him questions, just to talk about his experience because he wasn't supposed to survive. Nobody survives that kind of that kind of surgery or that kind of cancer. But Pat's four years old and here he is, lived all this time. He was a miracle. He was a walking miracle. Why did God save him from that? I mean, Jesus says that it might that it's so that his works, God's works, might be displayed in him. Were they being displayed? Because you know, if you knew Pat at all, you know that a lot of times he was miserable, ridden, just riddled with pain. So much so that you know, he struggled to live without pain medication. You know, he, he would say, I'm not like one of those guys out on the street. I'm not like, I'm not a drug addict said, I'm just taking prescription medicines that doctors have been given to me, and now i got to have them. He was imprisoned by it. You know, he's 16 years old, and a lady backing out of a driveway runs into him while he's driving his motorcycle, breaks his leg. The doctor puts him back poorly, and it, it whacks his whole body out of line. And it just has this knock-on domino effect and, and his, spine's, his spine is messed up and his neck's messed up and he ends up having 
as much metal as man in his body. Over 70 something surgeries. God, how, how are your works being displayed in my life? I wanted, I wanted Pat to know that, that God had a purpose for him. I wanted Pat to know that, that God saw him where he was. And even in the days when he would spend a lot of time by himself, just sitting in his chair in his living room, he was not alone. I wanted him to be able to know God intimately. Because, you know, in that time of my life, I was trying to understand more of that myself. I was trying to understand, how do we know God beyond just religion, beyond just showing up on a Sunday morning, how do we know God? What is it like to walk with Him? What is it like to be joyful in every circumstance? To know whom I have believed and being convinced that He's able to keep what I've entrusted to Him and for that to be an abiding joy. I, I wanted to know that. I wanted Pat to know that. That though he was in pain, he could have purpose for his life. We talked about that for hours and hours and hours and hours. Pat said to me, he said, Dan, if I'm going to be honest with you, I've been going to church all these years, but I'm not sure I believe. I'm not sure I believe in God. And if I do believe in God, I'm mad at him. It's one thing to be able to talk to somebody about God. It's a, you know, it's another thing to, you know, sit and read with them, but it, it's, it's something entirely more for them to actually speak to God. To have, through prayer, a face-to-face -face conversation with God. Pat and I prayed a lot. Most of the time it looked like him sitting in his chair and me kneeling beside him just holding hands. And lots of times it was very tearful. Because I wanted so desperately for Pat to know God's nearness. And the emotions of that was very raw. And I would encourage him at first, I, I would encourage him, Pat, talk to him. He'll give you understanding. He'll give you hope. He'll give you purpose. He'll give you comfort. He'll give you relief. I mean, this is all the stuff we're promised. And he would say, Dan, I'm, I'm trying. I, I just don't know how to talk to God. And for a time, it got better. We met every single day. For three months, we met every single day for the purpose of learning how to talk to God. One of the most challenging and, and meaningful prayer times that we had together was... Um, we were sitting in the car, we were driving, and we were talking about if God can heal or not. And we just we just happened to be not too far from, uh, I guess we were on the way home, because we pulled in a parking lot across the street from, from Rama, I believe. And we just sat there. And, you know, Jesus says, if you pray and not doubt, you'll have what you ask for. And I said, Pat, I don't, I don't know how to pray this prayer. I want to pray this prayer with you. But I'm, I'm afraid to. And by this time, I'm just a blubbering mess. I'm just crying. I'm looking at him and say, Pat, because I don't... If God can do whatever he wants to do, but if God decides not to just make you whole... I don't want you to lose faith in him. And he, he looked at me and he said, he said, well, couldn't hurt to try. And so we tried. And we asked for a miracle. And I don't, I don't know, I don't know if we prayed without doubting or not. 
but we prayed in submission that God would do what he wanted to do and that's what we asked for you know we pray God you can and, and this is what we want but more than that we want what you want what you want and maybe I don't know maybe that's a cop out But what excites me is that I believe in the scriptures and the scriptures say that we can be whole again. You know, John says, we don't know what we'll be, but we know we'll be made like him. Paul says, the, Im the perishable will be replaced with the imperishable that our, our, our earthly body, we're born with an earthly body and we, you know, we, we represent this or, or we reflect to this earthly body, but, but we'll be given a heavenly body. It's like a whole nother thing. It's what the cross is about. And so finally, Pat... Pat knows fully what he and I struggled to believe. You know, Paul writes these words, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know fully even as we have always been fully known. God's plan is that, has always been, that Pat would know him. Pat had the opportunity to know God better, as we all do. I, I believe, because I'm a father, I believe that, that God is just desperate for us to know him. And I believe that Pat tried. Because he and I tried together. And I'm, I'm thrilled to think that he's whole now. And that a time will come when he'll introduce me to the one I was trying to introduce him to. And he'll show me around. We, we do not mourn like those who don't know these things. Truth is, I couldn't be happier for Pat right now. The tears I have are not tears of sorrow, they are tears of joy. <laughs> for his release and freedom. I believe that God is good and I believe that he keeps every promise. And I believe that as broken a faith as Pat had and as broken a faith as I have, because Jesus died for us, we will be with him and we will meet our Father and we will be together. And so this is not farewell. As you know, this is, I'll see you later. I'm sorry I can't be there with you to hug you and to cry with you and to rejoice with you. But I want you to know that I'm there with you in spirit and that I love you all deeply. And though, um, you know, seasons change, 
my heart for you has not changed. Thank you for letting me do this. And uh, we send you our love.